Welcome back to our Sabbath School lessons for this quarter titled God's Mission, My Mission. We've been studying the fact that we can only understand God's mission if we understand God. You can't understand the mission of God until you understand the God of mission. And we've looked at the last two weeks, the first two weeks of our quarter, at the fact that God longs to save men and women. He is a redeeming God. He wants us to be restored into his image. And we've studied the fact that all through Scripture we have this golden thread of God working to restore human beings to his image, God, the God of mission working to save people. In this week's study, we're going to focus a little more on God's call to mission. We brought that out last week some, but it's more definitely brought out in the lesson this week. In God's call to mission, we look at our memory text in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This text becomes the theme of this week, Acts 1, and we're looking there at verse 8. It's a familiar Bible passage, but there are some emphasis points that bring the passage into a fresh light for us, a new revelation. Acts 1, verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now notice what it says, you receive power. The power to witness does not come from us. It comes from God. We can have a variety of strategies to reach people for Christ. We can have well thought through plans. We can have radio stations and TV stations and marvelous presses and educational institutions and hospitals. We can have all of this machinery set up, but unless the power of the Holy Spirit fills each of our hearts as believers, we will be powerless in witness. So Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me. Notice, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria into the ends of the earth. Jerusalem. What do you know about Jerusalem in the days of Jesus? It was a city that rejected its Lord. You had the Jewish population there and uh, priests that um, yelled, crucify him, crucify him. But more than that, because many of those Jews, of course, became Christians when the Holy Spirit was poured out here in the very book of Acts, they had sensitive hearts. It was the Jewish leadership that turned their back on Jesus. But look, what about Romans? Romans dominated Jerusalem in the first century. It was Roman soldiers that put the nails through his hands. Roman soldiers that put a crown of thorns upon his head. Roman soldiers that uh, sealed up the tomb and stood guard over it at the resurrection. Look, here is the key thing. Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. What do you think was going on in the mind of those disciples? Jesus says to them when he's about ready to ascend to heaven, go back to Jerusalem, but go back in the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, go back into that hostile environment, go back into a Judaism that hadn't accepted their Messiah, go back to Romans who had crucified the Messiah, go back to that environment, and Jesus said, you go with the power of the Holy Spirit. Go therefore first to Jerusalem, then go to Samaria. Samaria, where they've rejected you? Samaria, Lord, are you sure you got that right? The neighboring province? Go to Judea, You're, then go to the ends of the earth. How can we do this, Lord? You know, in the days of Christ, the Roman Empire probably had about 60 million people. There are about 120 that met in the upper room. What's that ratio? about one Christian to every 500,000 people. It, the task seemed overwhelming, but Jesus said, you go. Armed with the Holy Spirit, 
Go out in the power of the Spirit. And that's our lesson for this week. God's call to mission. God never says mission is going to be easy. God never says mission is going to be without its challenges. But what God does say is, I'll be with you and I'll empower you. When you go to Sunday's lesson, it's titled Moving Out of Our Comfort Zone. Is it to moving out of your comfort zone to knock on your neighbor's door and hand him a book like Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, or Great Controversy? Is it out of your comfort zone to share, to pray with your work associate who's just lost his wife to cancer? Is out of your comfort zone to counsel with that woman going through the trauma of a divorce? Sometimes God calls us out of our comfort zone to give a Bible study, to get involved in the lives of other people. He calls us out of our comfort zone to conduct an evangelistic meeting. Now, in Genesis 11, we start with what I thought was a kind of an interesting way to start with the building of the Tower of Babel. Why would our authors start with the building of Tower of Babel? The more you study it, I think you can understand the reasoning here. The Tower of Babel was built as a monument, as a monument of self-aggrandizement, as a monument of pride. And uh, in Genesis 11, verse 4, it says, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. God had promised that the world would never be destroyed by a flood again. The Babel builders wanted to build a tower in defiance and rebellion against God to protect themselves. They would have built a city around that tower where people would have lived together. God scattered them by confusing the languages to send them out dispersed so that they would have more of an opportunity in that dispersed fashion to know him and to share his love with others. Um, here, the scripture, the last paragraph says, the scripture does not say it explicitly. Ellen White says they didn't trust God's promise and that he would never, that he would never destroy the earth with water again. We talked about that. They intended to build for their own perceived safety rather than to trust God's word. Whatever their ultimate motives, God knew that their intentions were not pure, but filled with selfish ambition. So he prevented them from achieving their goals. God prevented them, but why? Because he's a God of mission. He knew that if they were all bunched together, all congregated together, that apostasy and rebellion would have flourished even more. So he scatters them, and in that scattering, desires them to know him and to come to be restored into his image. And as he scatters them, he does it for the specific purpose of sending them out as they come to him in mission. He wanted his people to be a blessing to the whole world. And you find that in the next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. We looked at it last week, verses 1 to 3, where God says to Abraham, get out of your country. God always says to us, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the thing that is keeping you from mission and participating with me. And he says, I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you, make your name great. You'll be a blessing. So God scattered the Babel worshipers so they would know him and be a blessing. God led Abraham out of his comfort zone so he would be a blessing. And uh, God's covenant promise down through the centuries was a covenant promise so his people would be participating with him in his mission to be a blessing. You know, the authors list six texts, and these texts take us from Genesis in the Old Testament to Matthew in the New Testament, and they are laser-focused on the promise of Christ to come to redeem the human race and the fulfillment of God's mission so we can participate too in mission. Genesis 3.15 is the first messianic promise where God says to the serpent that the Messiah would come and you, serpent, would wound his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Promise of the Messiah. The devil would be defeated on Calvary's cross. Genesis 17, 19, God gives an everlasting covenant to Abraham, the covenant 
of the coming of the Messiah in the eternal life. Numbers 24, 17, God talks about a star that will rise out of Jacob to lead the wise men from probably Iran, Iraq, over to the Messiah. Now notice, it's very interesting when you look at it. The Messianic promise is given in Eden. Genesis 17 talks about Abraham going out to bless all nations. And God chooses to lead to the Messiah's birthplace people from Iran or Iraq that knew nothing about Christianity. Uh, then he talks about a virgin conceiving and having a son in Isaiah 9, 6. He talks about the time of Christ's coming in Daniel 9. And then Emmanuel got with us in Matthew 1. What is the point of all those texts? The point is that God is a God of mission, that he has sent his people on a mission to cooperate with him in mission, and that down through the entire Old Testament, focusing on the New Testament, this God of mission has one purpose, to redeem human beings. Abraham is called by God. Now, Abraham is often mentioned as the father of the faithful. But when you look at Abraham, when God calls him, he has some real problems. He's called into the land where the Canaanites are that battle and war against the people of God. A famine strikes the land. Abraham has to go down into Egypt. And when he does, he lies about who his wife is and says that it's his sister. God protects her as she's taken into Pharaoh's courtyard and God puts judgments upon Pharaoh. Now, what do we learn from the story of Abraham relating to mission? We learn this, that Abraham was not perfect. Abraham failed, but God did not cast him off. The God of mission uses weak, frail human beings. And Abraham came to the place where he learned deeper trust in God. Sometimes God brings us over the same test again and again and again. Ultimately, Abraham had to take his firstborn son, Isaac, onto the mountain to sacrifice him. Absolute trust. He did not trust God enough when to call Sarah his wife rather than his sister. But when it comes to Isaac, he has learned his lesson. And he, in an act of trust, he takes Isaac up that mountain and God provides the sacrifice. What's God teaching Abraham? He's teaching Abraham and teaching you and me that mission is God's, that we participate with him in his mission, and that God guides us even when we fail and restores us to his image. Wednesday's lesson, the early church in comfort zones. Acts 8, verse 1 to 4. God never said mission would be easy. God never said that it would be um, a cakewalk, uh, so to speak. It would be very, that, that mission wouldn't have any challenges or its problems. It does. Abraham faced problems. The Babel builders were sent out in their challenges. When Jesus came, he was oppressed and ridiculed and mocked and ultimately beaten. But look, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, talks about Saul persecuting the people of God. And it says in eight, chapter 8, verse 1 of Acts, they all were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then finally, Saul makes great havoc of the church in verse 3. And verse 4, those that were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Philip goes to Samaria. So God gets Philip to Samaria. How? Through persecution. So I want to point this out. In mission, there are obstacles. In mission, there are challenges. In mission, there are difficulties. But God is there. God was with Abraham in the famine, in the, in the battle with the Canaanites in going to Egypt. God was with Jesus when he faced ridicule and mockery, when he faced the whip and the nails and the cross. God is there, and God is with the disciples as they are scattered, and Philip goes to Samaria. And the interesting thing is that often persecution and difficulty is the very object of God's mission. I was visiting China some time ago 
and visited with a young pastor who was cast into prison. And I asked him, why were you cast into prison? And he said, I was cast there because I was a criminal. And I said, you were a criminal cast into prison? Yeah. How did you become a pastor? Well, there was an Adventist layperson that was distributing literature like Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, Great Controversy in Chinese. He was arrested, placed in prison. And this younger pastor said, when this layperson was put in prison, each evening he would get a beating and rough men beat him. And his nose would be bloodied, his mouth would be bloodied, but he prayed for them. And I saw him in prison and the witness of his life was so powerful that he was let out of prison eventually after he served his term. And this young pastor, I was let out of prison. I looked up this man. He gave me Bible studies, led me to Christ. And I became an Adventist pastor because of a lay person that was put in prison and witnessed to me in prison. God at times allows difficulties and challenges to come in mission when we participate in his mission because through all of that, the gospel message is spread. So we start where we are. We, we, we end this lesson going back to the beginning of the lesson. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We witness to those that lie nearest to us, our Jerusalem. We witness to our family, our friends, our working associates, our neighborhood. We witness then to that next level, those that are a little distance away, Samaria and Judea, a little distance away. God enlarges our territory. Then to the ends of the earth. There are times that God calls us to mission in various places. Ellen White, in Friday's lesson, gives us this admonition. The Gospel Commission is the great missionary charter of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for people to come to them. They were to go to the people with their message. So Israel, God brought foreign nations to them. But now God is inviting us to participate with him in the mission of winning the world. We are to go, to go, to go, to make disciples of all nations. Here's your assignment this week. How would you define the word mission as you apply it to your own life? How do you apply mission to your own life? What is God leading you to do in mission? Secondly, in what ways could you daily express mission in your attitude and behavior? How can you be more mission-minded in your daily tasks? So I want you to be thinking about that and praying over that question this week. How can you be mission-minded in the daily tasks of life? How can you be mission more mission-minded to your children that may not know Jesus, to a husband or wife who doesn't know Jesus? How can you be more mission-minded to the other students at the university that you attend? How can you be more mission-minded on your job, at your work? How can you be more mission-minded and get involved with the church in maybe planting a new church in a neighboring community. So the question becomes, how can you participate with Christ in his mission to the world? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you call us a mission. Thank you that uh, life is more than a round of simply getting up and going to work and eating a little breakfast and coming home and watching television, the news, and doing the same thing the next day but you've called us to mission. Life is exciting, life is dynamic, because we have the privilege of working with you in your mission. We thank you for that. Teach us ways we can be more effective in mission, more involved in mission. In Jesus' name, amen.